<laughs> Welcome back. This is Applied Statistical Analysis. This is our last week with a new topic. The next lecture and the last will be a review lecture. Today, we'll be going over categorical outcomes. So there are going to be times where your outcome is not a continuous measure like we've had basically this whole class. Today's going to be about how we handle those situations. For the most part, for this class, we're going to have a really simple approach called chi-square. And we're also going to talk about a more complex version, logistic regression, that's built on regression. For chi-square, it is for simple research questions. It's not controlling for other factors. And it doesn't provide a whole lot of information other than telling you if there's a difference or not. When we get to logistic regression in a moment, we're going to find out that it can handle a wide variety of research questions, much more complex research questions with all types of predictor variables. Chi-square, on the other hand, is restricted to just categorical. So the general requirements, you need a at least one categorical variable. You can have more than that. Often we, we look at two. If you have one, it's called a goodness of fit. Chi-square goodness of fit. If you have more than one, we often call it a test of independence. So goodness of fit is just saying, do things look evenly distributed or as we would expect if we don't expect a even distribution. The test of independence is testing if two or more categorical variables are independent of each other or if they're related. Shockingly, I know, uh, we're going to use the same six-step approach. For chi-squared, the assumptions are pretty minimal. You have independence of data. You don't want uh, people influencing each other's data. We want the appropriate measurement, which in this case is categorical variables. And then the last one, which will make more sense in just a little bit, is that the expected frequency per cell is five or more. That means if you have certain things that are really rare, you need to get a big sample in order to have several of them represented in the data. What's nice is these are nothing new. The only thing with expected frequency, we just are supposed to check the expected frequencies. And Jamovi gives us those values so we can check them pretty easily. For the null and the research hypotheses, the null is that the observed frequency, the OF, is the same as the expected frequency, EF. This just means that what we expected by chance is roughly what we observed. The research hypothesis is saying that's not the case. The observed frequency is somewhere different than the expected. For the critical regions, we're going to use an alpha of 0.05. We're going to use Jamovi's p-value to judge that. And the Jamovi tutorial on my website is really good to walk through this. If you come to my website and come over here to Jamovi tutorials, there's one on chi-square goodness of fit and test of independence. We'll click on that. This is based on an older version of Jamovi, but everything should be very similar. What we're going to use is some old class data. We have the degree type and a bunch of other categorical variables. First thing we're going to do is a goodness of fit. To do that, we're going to go to frequencies and come down to n outcomes chi-square goodness of fit. These options pop up when we do that. And what we're going to bring over is a would you rather option where the uh, two options as part of that question was fly and money. When we bring it over and when we click on expected counts, this is what we get. In this table, we see how many were observed. So six people said fly. 
and 19 people said money, and how much we expect. In both cases, we expect 13. The p-value down here is testing if the observed values are different than the expected, which in this case is just testing if money and fly were responded to uh, equally. In this case, the p-value is significant, and so we would say no, they're not they were not responded to the same. And if we look at the table up here, we see money was responded to a lot more than fly. If we don't really have any reason to believe that fly and money should be the same, we could change the ratio and that'll change what the chi-square is testing. Further, we can come to the chi-square test of independence. Here, using the same data, we're going to click on frequencies and come down to independent samples or chi-square test of association. That's another name for it. When we click on that, we're given all of these options. And these options, we're going to be able to bring over two variables, one for rows and one for columns. When we do that, what we're going to do here is we're going to bring over degree type, which is doctorate or master's, and would you rather, which is uh, flyer money like we saw before. Already we're getting some information out. We have how many people have a, were going to get a doctorate degree and answered fly, which is just one person. How many had a master's degree and answered fly, etc. P-value down here is saying that the two variables do not seem to be related. That is, the response on one of the variables doesn't depend on what the other variable is. In this case, I would be saying maybe master's students are more likely to say fly, or doctorates more likely to say money. In this case, that's not the case. We don't see a relationship between the two. We can then click on statistics and we can get more information out. In this case, we're just going to ask for the fee in Kramer's V or Kramer's fee, depending on who's saying it. In this case, they're both the same, 0.204. We can also get some other information if we have a two by two table, which in this case we do because we just have two levels for each of our variables. We could ask for the odds ratio, but instead we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Later in our lecture, we're going to talk about what this means right here, the P coefficient. Last thing we come to is the cells options. This one we need to click on expected so that we can test, we can see if our assumption of having all expected values being five or more is violated or not. In this case, we can look at the expected for each cell. And we have two cells, the two and the four for the master's and doctorate fly conditions that violate this assumption. So we have a problem with that assumption in this analysis. If we come back to PowerPoint, let me scroll back up. Now that we've calculated our test statistics, we now need to understand what our effect size means. We have the fee and Kramer's V or fee. What's interesting about these is if you have the fee, if it's close to 0.1, that's small. 0.3 is moderate and 0.5 is large. If you have the Kramer's V, it actually depends on your degrees of freedom where those rough cutoffs are. Lastly, we want to interpret the results. This is a really good one that you find on page 577. And it's that the voters' opinions of the president's policies were associated with the voters' political affiliations. So you have the voters' opinions must be categorical, and then the voters' political affiliations must be categorical. And what you have is a chi-square with the degrees of freedom and how many people are in the sample. 
the chi-square value, the p-value, meaning it's significant, and our phi, which is 0.5. If you remember from the last slide, that means it's a large effect. And then it goes on to interpret what this actually means in practice. In this case, it means more Democrats and fewer Republicans approved of the president's policies than would be expected by chance. If you answer this way, that is perfect. Uh, that's a great response for a chi-square analysis. All right, and now we're going to talk about logistic regression. We're going to see some similarities with regular regression and with chi-square, but it's going to be kind of a mix between the two. So far, we've always wanted a continuous outcome when it came to regression or other, other than the chi-square. So when you have an outcome that's something like substance use or not, does someone use substances? Whether or not they have cancer or whether or not they bought something. Logistic regression is just like linear regression, but works with these kind of variables. What it's gonna to try to do is instead of fitting the best fitting line, it's trying to find the best fitting S curve. The reason why it does that is trying to line up nicely with where the responses really are at one and zero. So the curve that we actually end up getting, this S curve, is the model estimated probability of being a one. So either yes, using substances, or yes, having bought it, or yes, having cancer. Just like in regular regression, there's simple and multiple regression. Simple is just one predictor in the model, and it tells you if that one predictor is associated with the odds of Y being one. And then multiple is just having more than one predictor, and it tells you if, while holding the other variables constant, if that predictor is associated with the odds of Y being equal to one. This is going to look a little bit different, but similar to what we did with linear regression. This other side where we have the intercept and slope, that's just like linear regression. But on this other side, we have this logit giving this y a hug. And basically it's a mathemat mathematical uh, function that makes it so we can use regression to understand an outcome that's binary. If you were to go on to take more re uh, regression type classes, you would learn a lot more about this. The last piece always is that epsilon, that's the unexplained stuff and the odds of why. That's uh, other reasons other than what's in our variable, why, why might be higher odds or lower for a certain person. So an example of using logistic regression would be you have two variables, X and Y. X may be continuous, it could be categorical as well, but Y needs to be binary. In other words, it has to have two levels, can't be more or less than that. We want to know if increases or decreases in Y are associated or predict changes in the chance of Y equaling one. That's really why we're using logistic regression ultimately is trying to predict the outcome accurately using just the information from the predictors. A better prediction tells us that the predictors uh, are more strongly related to the outcome. The general requirements, you need two or more variables. The outcome needs to be binary. And the predictors can be continuous or categorical or both, either one. It can be a combination of them. Again, we're gonna use the same six step approach. Hopefully this has been just basically tattooed into your mind. For logistic regression, we have independence, appropriate measurement. We have normality of distributions. This is about residuals again. And homoscedastic. The variance around the line should be roughly equal across the whole line. These are notoriously much more difficult to assess than in linear regression. The other assumption is it should have a logistic relationship. Logistic just means that S curve. In other words, we're saying an S curve represents the data well. 
if it really doesn't, then logistic regression, regression might not be good. And then again, with just like with linear regression, we can't leave any variables out that might be influencing both the predictor and the outcome. We can kind of go back and think about the causality discussion we had in week 12. These are no different. We can assess all these things normally. Homo scedastic has scatter plots, but it's still very difficult with logistic regression. Logistic can be with scatter plots. And then no omitted is checking correlations, know the theory, what, according to theory, should we be including in there? For the scatter plots, what I would recommend is for logistic, you want to see would any form of, it, of an S fit a lot of those points. If, for example, you have a lot of points here, and then that's for zero, and then you have some points here, and then you have more points down here, an S curve is not going to fit that well. It, sh it would be like an S curve that uh, comes back down. That would be a problematic distribution for logistic regression. Just like regression, we're testing if the slope is different from zero. We're going to use an alpha of 0.05. To run logistic regression, we're going to go to regression. And now it, the menu looks a little bit different, but what you're doing is you're going to still select two outcomes. When you do, you're going to get something that looks like this. The outcome will go in the dependent variable area. And as you can see with the Venn diagram symbol there, it wants a categorical variable. And then you can include covariates and factors just like you had with regression. This is going to give us some output. The output is going to be in what's called the log odds. On its own, it's not going to be super interpretable, but the direction does tell you something. So for example, if we come to the income in the model coefficients over here in the output, what that's saying is that as income increases, you're less likely to use substances because it's going down. The actual units of that are not always super clear what they mean. And then down here, where you have the other model options, there's going to be other things that you can control. This is an example output. We have our estimate that is in log odds. But then we also have this odds ratio. Odds ratio, if there's no effect, it's going to be close to 1. If there is an effect, it's going to be either lower or higher than 1. In this case, it's lower than one, and it is a significant effect if you look at the p-value. The odds ratios are often how people will interpret logistic regression. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time working on them, but we will give you enough that you'll understand roughly what they mean. When it comes to the odds ratio, when it's below one, it means as income increases, the odds of using substances decreases by approximately 1 minus 0.923. In other words, it's a 7.7 .7 decrease in the odds of using substances. So if my income goes up by $1,000 because income's in thousands, if my income goes up by $1,000, the odds of using substances decreases by 7.7%. That's what that one would mean. What's also cool is in Jamovi, you can ask for the predicted probability, and it'll give you the S-curve. And this S-curve suggests that there's really no one along the income, even those that are really low in income that are really, really likely to use substances, they are more likely, 75%, but no one is like basically guaranteed to use substances. Whereas as you earn more and more, 
you're basically guaranteed not to. We also get the classification table, which tells us how good our model is predicting the outcome. This is our observed zero and one. And this is our predicted. So the, our model predicted only four people would use substances. And three of those were correct. One of them was wrong. And it predicted most people don't use substances. 29 were correct and five were wrong. This gives us some um, percent correct. So on our model was really good at predicting who wasn't going to use substances, but it wasn't so good at predicting who was going to use substances. It only had 38% correct there. We've got five wrong and three correct. We also could do this with a categorical predictor. In this case, we're comparing the two shows. We have The Office and Parks and Rec. Again, that's a log odds units. If it's positive, it means there's a higher chance. Negative, a lower chance. This one is not significant, meaning there's it's not a significant difference. And then the odds ratio is saying it's above one. So individuals in the office have an odds of using substances 50%. In other words, 1.5 minus one is 0.5. So 50% higher than Parks and Rec. So because it's the office minus Parks and Rec, if, if this one, uh, if this value is higher, that means this one's higher which means people in the office have an odds of using substances 50% higher than in Parks and Rec. We also can get the predicted probabilities of using substances here. And what we can see is the predicted probability for Parks and Rec was somewhere around 20%. And here's our confidence interval. And for the office, it's about 25%. However, what's interesting when we come here, when we look at the predictive values, our model never predicts that any of the groups will use substances. Instead, it predicts everyone won't. And this can happen sometimes when your outcome, whatever you're trying to predict, is really unlikely. So using substances in this data set wasn't super likely. So it's 100% correct on predicting those that didn't do substances, but it was 0% correct for those that did. So the effect size is actually the odds ratio. To help you understand what that actually means, we, we've been interpreting it, but what it means, it's, it's the odds of y when x is one unit higher divided by the odds of y when x is not one unit higher. So it's whatever it is. In other words, for a one unit increase in y, what happens to the, or one unit increase in x, rather, what's the change in the odds of y being one? When it comes to easy cutoffs for odds ratio, it varies so much by uh, field and by even the research question. I'm not even going to give you any exact cutoffs. All right, the last step, of course, is interpreting the results. And here, something like the logistic regression analysis showed that income significantly predicted the odds of substance use, reporting the odds ratio. That's not negative, sorry, that's a typo. Odds ratios are always positive. And P equals 0.016. And then as income increases by 1,000, the odds of using substances decrease by 7.7%. That would be a good interpretation of our first model. And now we're going to talk briefly about multiple logistic regression. So instead of 
just one predictor, and now we have multiple. And the slope is now the change in the odds of y equals 1 for a 1 unit change in x while holding the other predictors constant. And just like with linear regression, it provides us with a few more things to think about. We have variable selection assumption checks. It's much more difficult in logistic regression. There, uh, usually you have to start to get a feel for what looks weird and whatnot. You also have multicollinearity problems and interactions. For variable selection, when theory isn't super clear, uh, these work. But what I recommend is covariates uh, in the model first and then the predictor of interest and see what happens. Or you can use a machine learning approach lasso. This is only when theory is not clear. If theory is clear, you want to go with theory. The assumption checks. Jamova only really provides the collinearity check. Uh, these, these won't really be covered in this class. If you find out that you need to use logistic regression, we can talk about it in person. When it comes to multicollinearity, you can check this in Jamovi. Uh, as a reminder, collinearity is when two or more predictors are very related to each other or are linear combinations of each other. And so they are so overlapping that the model can't distinguish them. Lastly, we can do interactions just like we did in linear regression, but now the interactions are going to have this kind of S shape. Neither of these really show that a ton, but you actually start to see uh, this pattern where you have uh, an interaction between awkwardness and biological sex on substance use. And so for those that are female, I believe zero was female, can't remember, don't quote me on that. As awkwardness increases, you're less likely, just slightly less likely to use substances. However, if you're male and your awkwardness increases, your probability of using substances goes up a lot, especially if you're really awkward, it goes up quite a bit. You can do this in Jamovi, just like we did in regression, but this time we're going to be doing it inside of logistic regression, but it's the same idea. In the model builder, you select both variables, click on the drop down one, and click interaction. When you do that, it's going to show a variable that has show, and then a star, and then married. This will give you a lot of good output including this plot that we saw earlier. So for this class, that is it about logistic regression. It is mostly important for you to understand what it is, what it's trying to do, and be introduced to how to do it. But it is pretty advanced for this class, and so we're not going to do a whole lot more about them. And as always, if you have questions, post them to the discussion board before class starts so we can address them in class and hopefully highlight uh, areas where many people are having difficulty understanding.